Hi. You just caught me practicing. Did you notice as we read the Revelation that God tells us we're going to be playing instruments in heaven? He mentions harps and he mentions trumpets. Thought I'd get a head start on that by practicing my guitar here. I don't want to go to heaven on the first day, be caught in beginner guitar class and have to catch up with the rest of the folks there. What got me to thinking about it was that we're about ready to begin our study of the next vision in the Revelation, the vision of the seven seals. And God begins that vision by taking John and us with him into heaven, where we see God on the throne of heaven ruling the universe and all the angel choirs singing and playing their instruments together. What God is going to show us is the future. He's going to tell us what will happen in this world. We're going to see these things with our own eyes, along with everybody else who lives in this world in every age. Now, the vision of the seven seals is contained in four chapters of Revelation. Revelation chapter 4 to Revelation chapter 7. So let's begin now. Begin our time together and ask the Lord's presence and blessing on our study. Heavenly Father, as we begin again our study of the Revelation, we ask that you open our hearts to understand your message Help us apply that to our lives. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. This is lesson four we're beginning here, the vision of the seven seals. It's found in Revelation chapter four to seven. Um, and we'll be following God's thought progression here. It's the first thing you have to keep in mind. It's my contention that in the study of the Revelation, this is the thing people are most unaware of. This is the thing they miss, and it creates the problems that we have and the confusion that we see. You need to be aware of God's thought progression from one vision to the next so you can follow his line of thought as he walks through the revelation. The vision of Christ among the lampstands, God presents the first and most important thought. It's about the light. That's the only thing that matters. Shedding that light and spreading that light in this world is the thing that determines the world's existence. When the light has gone as far as it can go, the world will come to an end. Each of us has a role to play in that. God has privileged us to be lampstands. We get to share that hope with the people in our lives. That's why each of us has another day to live on this earth. You are going to meet people today who need the hope that lives in your heart. You are going to find opportunities today in your life where people need to find out what you know and they don't know. That's why you have today. You get to be a lampstand. You get to share that light. Well, that's the first thought. After that, of course, we had this uh, vision of the seven letters where God showed us the lampstand experience. Here's what it's going to be like when you share that light. Here's how you will be encountered by the darkness as you share the light. And here's how that darkness is going to affect you. Seven different examples. So far, so good. But now we're going to see what it's going to be like in this world as we live in this world with that hope in our heart. You should follow the progression here. In chapter 4, God begins to introduce the vision of the seven seals by setting the context. Chapter 4 opens and John suddenly sees God on his throne in heaven. All the beings of heaven around him are celebrating. It's an amazing picture. And in God's hand is a little scroll. That scroll contains the future of the world, a message that all of us need to know, the message of what's going to happen from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. That's written on that scroll. But there's a problem. No one in heaven can open the scroll. And when John sees this, he weeps because the message is so important and people need to know this and now we kind of have access to it. And so John is immediately told, don't weep because the lamb is here. The lamb who looks like he has been slain. He suddenly appears in heaven, everyone rejoices, and he takes the scroll and prepares to open it. This is the lamb that Jesus Christ is. This is ascension day in heaven. That's what you're seeing in chapter 5 of Revelation. Remember the Bible's description of Ascension Day in the book of Acts? The disciples were standing there. Jesus ascends into heaven. The disciples stand there looking at the cloud, wondering where he went. And some angels appear and say, hey, why are you looking at the clouds? He's going to come back again just like you saw him go. In the meantime, you've got work to do. So they go out to do the work of apostles. But this is what happened on the other side of the cloud. Jesus the Lamb, looking like he had been slain, enters heaven and everyone rejoices. Jesus takes the throne at the right hand of God, takes the scroll of the future in his hand, and begins to unfold that future for us to live in. That's the picture that God sets the scene for the vision of the seven seals. God sets the context to reveal the third revelation truth, revealing what life's going to be like in this world until Jesus returns. 
Now, in order to deal with that question, we have to deal with the assumption. Picture this. Jesus sits on the throne of heaven right now. Nothing happens in this world unless Jesus personally allows it. Can't happen. If Jesus doesn't want it to happen, he will stop it right like that. So it's all under his control. So if you know that and you're a Christian and you know Jesus won the victory that he won and you know he's in full control, how would you expect him to treat the believers in this world and how would you expect him to treat the unbelievers in this world? What would your expectation be? But what I'm getting at is the perceived surface assumption. If people are pleasing to God, how will he treat them? We would expect what? If God is pleased with them, how will he treat them? We would expect blessings. If God is not pleased with someone, how would he treat them? What would we expect? Blessings? Or would God discipline him, say, I'm not pleased, shape up? Which would it be? Would you expect to see a difference between how the believers are treated and how the unbelievers are treated? On the surface, if we were God, what would happen? You guys are kind of lucky I'm not God. But if I were God, I'll tell you, I'd treat the good people good, and I'd treat the bad people bad, and there'd be a clear line like that, right? That would be the surface assumption. God, however, says that is not going to be what we see. And so he shows us the vision of the seven seals to set us straight. This is what you're going to see in this world, and what you're going to see will shock and surprise you. That's what Jesus reveals in this vision. What Jesus does is he opens the seals one at a time from the throne of heaven, and from the throne of heaven sends this out into the world. So notice Jesus is actually sending it in the form of horses in this case. First horse is a white one. The lamb opens the first of the seven seals, and there before me was a white horse. He was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. The question is, what's the white horse? And in the, in the world of Revelation, there's lots of controversy about this white horse. The biggest trouble people have with the white horse is the other horses. Each of the other horses appears bringing a bad thing, war and hardship and death. So people who study the Revelation assume the white horse must also bring a bad thing. And they try to make up what bad thing that is. They have all kinds of guesses. Books are filled with their guesses. But the Bible, remember, helps us interpret some things. And in this case, in Revelation 19, we see the white horse again. There before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True, and his name is the Word of God. According to that, who's riding the white horse? Jesus is. So that means the white horse isn't a bad thing, it's a good thing. And in that case, we have an assumption we can draw about the white horse. Based on Revelation 19, we can assume that the white horse actually represents the gospel, the gospel message. Jesus sends it out from his throne. It rides through the pages of history from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. Everybody's going to see this white horse. No matter what age they live in, it will always be present. What will happen in the world from the first until the second coming of Christ? The white horse of the gospel is going to ride throughout the world and is going to be seen by everyone. That's what we can count on. And that's what we will see in our own lives. Gospel present everywhere. Um, the white horse is riding. Question or comment on the white horse? Remember that every horse rides in every age. Everyone who lives in every age will see every horse. Everyone. This is what God is showing us. It's the future. And notice that it comes from the throne of God. Jesus sends the white horse out. So far, so good. But look at the second horse. It's a red one. When the lamb opened the second seal, then another horse came out, a fiery red one. Its rider was given power to take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. What does the red horse represent? What's God telling us the world will be like until Jesus comes again? We're going to see war in every age, in every era. We will see this red horse. There will be countries going to war, like now in the Ukraine. There will be people who kill one another, like we see in the news headlines every day. That's the red horse riding. Where does the red horse come from, according to the vision? Jesus opened the seal, 
Jesus, who's sitting where? At the right hand of God, in full control. The red horse comes from him. He sent it out with a message the world needs to hear. A message that says something's wrong between this world and the God who made it. This world's got a problem they got to fix, and they better get it now because a greater judgment's coming. The red horse is a mini-judgment, a warning to the world that repentance is needed now before it's too late. Unfortunately, the world doesn't hear that message very well. We're not hearing it on the news at night. When they talk about the Ukraine and the slaughter that's going on there, all we hear from our elected officials is, we need to give them more guns so they can kill more people. That'll help. That's how we view it. Nobody says, is there a spiritual message here? Is there something going on in this world we need to pay attention to? Not a thought like that. But it remains a warning from God just the same. We will see that red horse ride until Jesus comes again. Comments or thoughts? The next horse that you've seen and will see again, this is the black horse. When the lamb opened the third seal, there before me was a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand, and then I heard the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages, and do not damage the oil and the wine. What hardship is represented by scales and high prices for food? What's the black horse representing? Economic hardship, like inflation, like stock market crashes, like depressions, like, like uh, loss of jobs. All these things that black horse brings with him. We're seeing the black horse now, right? Food prices rising like they are. Energy prices rising. That's the black horse riding in our lifetime in our backyard. Every person in the world, believer and unbeliever, is going to see that black horse ride. And it's going to ride from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ. You and I need to expect that. It will happen in this world. And notice it comes from the throne of God. God is in control of it. He sends the black horse. It carries a message of warning for the world. Something's wrong. Repentance is needed. But the world doesn't hear very well. Although they notice the horse and they talk about it all the time. Red horse and black horse riding on the screen. Comments or thoughts? Okay. Another horse, the pale one. That's the fourth horse. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, there before me was a pale horse. Its rider was named Death. They were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. What does this horse represent? What's going to be happening from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ? Death in all forms. Every person who lives is going to get to visit cemeteries. Every person who lives is going to know what it feels like to lose somebody you love. That pale horse will ride in our lives. It'll ride in famines. It'll ride in plagues. It'll rise through war. It'll ride through man's inhumanity to man. But that horse is going to ride and everybody's going to see it. It carries a message of warning from God. Many judgments warning us of the great judgment to come. So when you see politicians talking about, about the epidemic of gun violence, silliest thing you ever did here, you know, blame the gun. It's the gun's fault. We just got rid of guns. We'd all love each other. Um, they never blame the guy who shoots the gun. That isn't what we do. That's called racism. Don't do that. That's not fair. Blame the gun. That's how our world treats the pale horse and the red horse and the black horse. The world doesn't necessarily get the message, but the message is loud and clear, and someday they'll get it and understand what it meant for them. Comments, questions, thoughts? So, relating, before we go any further, relating this to the lampstand work, what opportunity do the horses present? What's God telling us that adds to the picture? We found out we're lampstands. We found out the job's going to be difficult. Now what are we finding out? Adversity gives us reason to be closer to God. That's true. Opportunity. So what Bruce has pointed out is the horses carry with them opportunity. The horses ride in people's lives. Despair increases, right? You look out the back window and you see the black horse riding out there bringing all kinds of economic hardship. You don't feel happy. You feel despair. You feel hopelessness. You feel powerless. All those things. And then you and I have opportunity. 
We can tell them, even though that black horse is right out there in your backyard, it's going to be all right. There's a God who cares about you. He'll see you through. The hardship and adversity brings us opportunity. The hope is more needed than it could ever be because these horses are riding. And that's what God wants us aware of. The work we have to do is important work. We're lampstand people. We get to share hope, and every day there's more reason to feel hopeless in this dark world. So we have opportunity to share what we have, and the need increases every day. The horses make that apparent. Comments, questions, thoughts? Well, I have one more, one more picture, and that comes from the fifth seal. The, specifically, this applies to Christians. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. They called out in a loud voice, How long until you avenge our blood? And then each of them was given a white robe, and they were told to wait a little longer until the brothers who were to be killed as they had been was completed. What's that tell you? What's going to happen from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ? According to that picture, what will we see? So what does God say to those who are in heaven, the souls in heaven? These are people who have been killed. And ask God, how long, God, till you take revenge on these terrible people? And what does God tell them? Two things. Wait a little longer until what? Notice the until. Until all the other believers are killed. <laughs> There's more got to die. That number has to be complete. Therefore, you got to wait a little longer. Believers are going to be persecuted. There will be Christians who will die for their faith. That's going to happen from the first coming of Christ to the second coming of Christ because the darkness hates the light. You can count on that. And it'll continue to happen until the end. Part of the experience on this earth. Everybody has it hard. Everybody sees the horses. And believers have it doubly hard because they get persecuted too. Do the horses ride in believers' backyards? Yeah. We've all seen it in our yards. We've all encountered that horse riding the black horse, the red horse, the pale horse. Every one of us knows someone who has died. Every one of us understands what that feels like. We know. They ride in our lives. Plus, we have persecution. All of that adds up to what you can expect to experience until Christ comes again. So, he ends of the sixth seal. Sixth seal brings this vision to an end, and he shows this picture. What is this picture in? I watched as he opened the sixth seal. The sky receded like a scroll, rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. They called to the mountains and the rocks, Hide us from the wrath of the Lamb, for the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? What is this picture? Judgment day. This is a picture of the judgment day. Notice who's talking in this picture. But who's asking for the mountains to cover us? Who's making that request? This is unbelievers. Remember all those people? throughout history, who had the red horse ride in their life and ignored the warning, said, what, we need are more bullets? Remember all those people who had the black horse ride in their life, the economic hardship, and they said, I need a bigger savings account? And remember all those people who had the pale horse ride as they bury their loved ones? And in each case, they failed to heed the spiritual warning of the horse. In each case, they said, oh, it's this or it's that, but it's not God. And now on the last day, those same people are going to get the warning. They're going to say, the mountains need to cover us. The wrath of the Lamb is apparent. The message from all those horses is now clear to us, and it's too late. Judgment Day. That's what will come. That's how it will all be brought to an end. That's what you can expect life will be like for the Lamb sends and everyone else in this world until Jesus returns. So, brings us to the lesson, the third truth. The Lamb is revealing the future of the world as he opens the seals. What does this vision reveal about what life will be like for all people in the New Testament until Jesus returns. Chaos. That would certainly fit. It looks like there's no control. It will look like there's no rhyme or reason to it. Wars and death and destruction everywhere you look, and people asking why. Why does this happen? How could this happen? It should never have been. I saw a woman on TV last night or this morning that 
What did she say? She was in, in a house in Milwaukee, and someone is outside shooting at the house, and she has daycare center in it. So she has seven kids she's taking care of, all laying on the floor, ducking under the bullets. And she wants justice. Why did this happen? She wants justice and accountability, she said. Of course, they don't know who shot the gun, don't know, nobody's arrested, no nothing. But the question, why? Why did these terrible things happen when the red horse comes riding through or the black horse comes riding through? Why, why, why? Jesus says, this is what's going to be happening. One word you want to look for? The word tribulation. We must, through much tribulation, enter the kingdom of heaven. That Jesus is telling us. Now, why would Jesus tell lampstands that this is what's going to happen? Why does he want us to know that? What's the point if you're a lampstand? Okay, in this world you'll have trouble, but I overcome the world. In other words, remember you're a lampstand even though bad stuff's happening. That's true. But in terms of the work, why would he tell us about the terrible tribulation? How would lampstands react? He's in charge. That's true. Jesus said, I told you it's going to happen, so don't be surprised. And remember, in the end, he wins. Tell me about the lampstand work. Look at that. You got something that'll fix this. Each of you have. Each of you has something that can affect the moment. And that something? Hope. This is opportunity to you. These horses may carry bad news for everybody else in the world. For us, they carry opportunity. Whose yard are they riding in? That's where I got to go. Because I got something that will help them. I can tell them, even though all seems hopeless now, you can be sure it's going to be all right. I can assure them that there's a God who loves them, and he sent me to tell them that. I can assure them that as dark as things look right now, it's not going to be what you think. Trust this God now. Many years ago, I saw a lady teach that lesson to her family in a, in a uh, intensive care room or a waiting room in the hospital in Rhode Island. I was there because one of my members had a relative who had a heart attack, and so they were there, so I was there. And in that same waiting room was a Catholic woman, clearly Catholic. She had about 10,000 children, and they're all there. And she, had, she wore black, and she must have been 80s, late 80s, ro- sitting in a rocking chair in this room, in this waiting room. And I assumed from what was happening there that they must all be there because the woman's husband was in the intensive care. I assumed that from what was going on. Anyhow, the grandchildren were there, and they're all crying. All these young grandchildren are crying, you know, and they're in their teens or a little younger, a little older. And one by one, they'd come up to the lady in the rocking chair. And they'd say, oh, Grandma, I'm so sorry. I'm so afraid. And to each one, the grandma said the same thing as she rocked in her chair. She kept saying, you just have to have faith. You just have to have faith. You just have to trust. Each one. It was amazing. Here's a woman when the sky is so dark and the hope is all gone, she's telling her family the thing they need to do. This is not the time to be afraid. This is the time to trust. This is the time to know it's going to be all right. Never forgot that scene, the comfort that she alone was able to give her family, and each one needed it, and each one came for it, and each time it was the same. That's your opportunity. You live in a world full of horses. Boy, do you have opportunity. You know people who are seeing these horses right now. That's why you have today. God gave you today not to think about yourself, but to think who's got a horse in their backyard. I need to go talk with them. They need me now. I can help. I can tell them something they need to know. It's going to be all right. Now, I got to tell you, um, I mean, I know I tell you this every week. I know we're working hard at making sure you see that clearly, the opportunity that's yours. But I think, if we're all playing straight with each other, that you find perhaps this is not such an easy message to internalize and carry into the world. The place where we stumble, if you're like me, the place where we continually stumble is in living the hope ourselves. We come into a class in Revelation and we come with a heart that knows something about being afraid. Because we've been afraid and perhaps are afraid. We enter a room like this, to a message like this, but in our own personal experience, we were worried last night about whatever we're facing. And we're worried this morning because it's not going away. And whatever the problem we got, we can't fix it, so there's the worry. 
Those things are our reality. And when that reality lives in our heart, a heart of worry, a heart that knows about fear, and then some silly preacher stands in front of us and says, hey, you know it's going to be all right, when we're not feeling it ourselves, then we can't be the lampstand God calls us to be. Worry and doubt are poison to hope. Poison. They're not normal. They're not acceptable. It's not okay. It's a problem that prevents us from being what we could be. And it's such a huge problem. It's not that we don't know that, that we actually can hear a message like this and say, yeah, I may be a lampstand, but not today. Maybe a lampstand, but I'm not feeling any of that hope, so I can't give it to anybody else. What does the Apostle Paul say in Corinthians? We comfort others with the comfort we ourselves have experienced. That's how you do it. Why do you think the horse is right in your life? Why do you think God lets a red horse or a black horse or a pale horse come into your life so that you could exercise that hope in your own heart and have something to share with someone else? You talk from experience. You know what it's like to not be afraid when there's all kinds of reason to be afraid. You know what it's like to put worry aside because the good Lord's standing by your side so it's going to be all right. You know that. That gives you something to share. But it takes something to fight through that in a setting like this so we can realize the privilege and the opportunity that it's ours. If worry and doubt are yours... Yes, this is in the way, and that has to be dealt with. Yes, ma'am, I hear you. What she's saying is, is there's another factor in this conversation. It isn't just our struggle to put our doubts aside and then shine the light. It's the need other people have to hear about that hope and light and the limited time they have to hear it. If we don't get to them, they may not have enough days left to find it, and they'll have missed out on an opportunity that we alone could give them because we knew them. They're people depending on us. So in a class like this, in a setting like this, with the message of the revelation, my, my hope would be, my expectation, my desire would be that, that we wouldn't walk out of a room like this, that we would float out of a room like this. The privilege that's ours, the opportunity that's ours. Why, this afternoon we'd look forward to it. We know people who don't have any hope and we've got something to give them. I'm going to get that phone right now and call them up. Or a visit, time to make some coffee, time to talk to them. In other words, the opportunity suddenly makes the whole day worth living. That's what's possible. If first we deal with the fear. So ask again, since we're being honest, and since I assume you know something about fear and worry, how can you get rid of the fear and the worry you have today? What can you do about it? How do you get rid of it so you can spend this day not worried? Yes, ma'am. God's word, specifically God's promises. When God wrote the Bible, that's God talking to us. When you know the passage of the Bible and repeat them in your head, that's God talking to you, saying, I will never leave you or forsake you, saying, there shall no evil befall you, neither shall any plague come nigh your dwelling, telling you, do not be afraid. Just trust in him. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. That's how I start my days. And when the worries and the fear come, those are the voices of God that speak in my ear every day personally to me. I know how it is to worry. I'm really good at it. I know what it's like to be afraid it comes natural to me. But when those things come, this is what I do. Put it aside through the promises of God. The more you, God speaks those promises to you, the more it drives the worry and fear from your heart and the more hope that you have for the moment. It's going to be all right. This God's on my side. Knowing that a shepherd boy named David could face a giant named Goliath and have no fear. God's on my side. God before me, who can be against me? That knowing that, the three men stood in a fiery furnace and said, God will keep the flames from us, and if he doesn't, that's okay too. It's going to be all right. I put it in God's hands. This God's on my side. That's your secret. That's what you know. That's what you get to share when you first exercise it yourself. That's the opportunity. So I hope you're not hearing the message here in the Revelation and saying, yeah, that's pie in the sky. It'll never be true for me. I'm still full of worry. Hope you're not doing that. I hope instead you're saying, boy, there's opportunity here. It's time I start listening to the promises of God 
and then sharing those promises with others. That's the lampstand work. And what you've heard in the third truth of the Revelation, that there's going to be tribulation in this world and we're all going to experience it, what you're hearing is there'll be tons of opportunity all around you every day. Opportunity unique to you because you know some people nobody else knows and you can talk to them. Comments, questions, thoughts, opinions. Yes, sir. <laughs> I love a man who's paying attention. What he, what he asks is, if there's supposed to be seven seals, how come I only saw six? <laughs> All right? Well, I was saving that for next time because he uses a seventh seal to introduce the next vision. <laughs> and that's why there's seven. <laughs> but I'm glad you asked because everyone else is thinking it, but they're, not, they're too chicken to ask. <laughs> so you'll get the seventh seal. It'll show up when God shows you the next vision, the vision of the seven trumpets. But in this case, with the twelfth question, again, there are seven seals. That's not an accident. The number seven is a reminder. When you see horses riding in your backyard, when you see economic hardship, when you see leaders of the world crying because everybody's dying in the war they started, when you see all of that and you wonder, how can this be? What's happening? God says, there's seven seals. Remember that. Or at least in case, trust, because one's coming. There's seven seals. And that means that in this terrible world, all these things are somehow playing a role in the spread of that gospel and the accomplishment of the gospel covenant. Remember what Ecclesiastes said, there's a time for everything under heaven, and then they give this long list, time to be born and a time to die, all kinds of things like that, the time to love and a time to hate. God can make all things beautiful in its time. That's what it says. Well, that's what he's talking about here. Even in these terrible things of tribulation, God's accomplishing his good purposes, his gospel purposes. And he reminds us of that with the number seven because our eyes and our ears wouldn't be able to find that on the surface. These are horses. They don't look good to me. And they're not bringing much pleasure. Anything else? Comment, question, opinion? Remember, if you're thinking it, everybody else is. They're just afraid. So you've got to ask. Them. Let's close our time together with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of the study and the reminder of the privilege that is ours, not only know your light, but to share that light with the people around us. Help us drive the doubt and fears from our heart this day with your precious promises and make us eager to share that hope with others. This we ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. So, seven trumpets next. See you next week. Mm -hmm.